welcome to the Saturday Morning Nerd Show. I'm Marcus Blake, your host, and join with me is the brewing sailor, Mr. Brendan Smith. Broadcasting today from Edgewater on Terra 2, because life in a Saltuna cannery at this point is more appropriate or more preferable to life on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And from the Electric Jellyfish podcast, Mr. Chad Womack. Broadcasting from the bottom of the ocean. Good to oh. see you guys. Yes, 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 yes. Well, um, it's, it's mostly it's coffee very, today, Chad. Mm. We we uh, we start this broadcast off with a very sad announcement. Uh, our press bar, our longtime Irish pub that uh, we, you know, Brent and I have known each other for over a decade. We met through there, um, and we've also live broadcasted from there a time or two and recorded some videos. Uh, Trinity Hall is no more, and. Uh, it really does feel like we're in the matrix and we're waiting to be unplugged from this nightmare. But, uh, and sadly we will no longer be able to frequent there after press screenings and no more recording videos. It's so, yeah, we're not doing too good, um, uh, regarding our favorite establishment. Um, thank God we have craft and growler, but, uh, it, it really does hurt. And that's why life on another planet might seem a little bit better. So, Anyway, we're going to move right along with this podcast because we are professionals and we have some fun things to talk about. Um, first things first, uh, for all you Spider-Man fans out there, you should be excited now. We did finally get the No Way Home trailer that dropped this week. Uh, that looks fun. Yeah, very excited about that. Um, although, as much as I'm excited about that, did y'all watch the final Kingsman trailer that dropped this week as well? No, I was not yeah. aware. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the Kingsman, the prequel. Yeah. Um, it looks really good. Honestly, I, I hate to say this, but after watching this, the Spider-Man trailer, uh, I'm looking forward to the Kingsman more. That's what I was seeing. Yeah, that's my point. It's like, I'm, I'm looking forward to Spider-Man, but I'm actually looking there's, to there's some there's some logical fallacies in the in in the Spider-Man trailer that they're gonna have to work really hard now that they've painted themselves into that corner. Like, right. yeah, Peter Parker's a wanted man. Uh, he just saved the freaking universe. <laughs> I think that buys you a little leeway. Right. It's a uh, yeah. So we'll see what happens, but uh, it, it, it's kind of funny. Um, I I love watching the Graham Norton show and. Uh, an episode I don't know, a few years ago with Ray Fines on there talking about, you know, how he's the new M and at one, you know, who doesn't want to be Bond and stuff. So I kind of feel like is you are a perfect M. I mean, they, you couldn't have found a perfect replacement. Love him. Keep it yeah. going. You are the new uh, Bernard Miller. Um, but I think you get your chance to kind of be James Bond in the Kingsman trailer. And he looks awesome. Mm -hmm. so I, I'm geeking out about that. I cannot. That's there's a handful of movies that I'm really looking forward to. Um, that like I'm just very very excited for. You know, new James Bond, obviously Top Gun two, but the King's Man that that really is kind of the top of my list because it, it it you know you don't really kind of expect it to be as good as the other ones, but then it looks absolutely amazing. So, also, I get the feeling that it's not going to have a bunch of modern politics shoehorned into it. I think it's just going to be a movie for fun. Exactly. And, you know, we could use a few more of those. Yeah, we don't. We were Julie Jones and I were kind of talking about that this week when she did her review on Sweet Girl, the Jason Momoa movie on Netflix. Um, and it's a fun little action revenge type movie, but it's also you know, let's throw out our social messages about how Big Pharma is evil and we need to have a Punisher-like character seek revenge on. <laughs> like, we, you're reminding us of stuff we already know. And Also, isn't that just like a story out of a Punisher novel? Like, right. Hasn't he already done that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't we go to the movies to escape from that shit? Um, you There's know. that too, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just saying. look, you know why we keep having themes of some madman trying to take over the world? Because it still works. And we <laughs> accept that there's always a madman yeah. <laughs> trying to take over the world. 
go. Let's just leave it at that. I I know big corporations are evil. Okay, and we're already reeling from dealing with big corporations ruining our pub, but. And honestly, we have a big corporation with a madman who is a prototypical Bond villain. We just have to cast him in that role, and it's Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right. Let's be honest. When he went to space, <laughs> I think this was like a remake of Moonraker. <laughs> I was just hoping he'd stay. Uh, I was, <laughs> I'm sure there were, there were several people secretly hoping an O-ring would fail. Yeah. <laughs> There goes Jeff Bezos, <laughs> and he goes over there, and he goes over there, and he goes over there, and, <laughs> and the rocket. Yeah. Oh shit! Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna get hate mail now. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. No. Look, it's a shooting star. Make a wish. <laughs> <laughs> he really is a part of the Make a Wish Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, okay. we'll we'll try to be nice. Well, we'll try. No, we won't. We'll try. We'll try. <laughs> All right. You so, guys can uh, try for me. <laughs> we this, ain't sticking no landing. This week, uh, we have a new magazine issue coming out, and uh, a couple of our young writers are doing their first featured article, uh, and it's titled Marvel Movies Then and Now. Uh, and they are going to... It's uh, Allison Costa's uh, son, oldest son and daughter, Hayden and Sid, who have both written for us. And they are basically doing a sibling rivalry on all of the Marvel movies since they finally got a chance to see everything over the last couple of years. And they are going to be rating, you know, from best to worst um, and seeing, you know, what they think. But I thought um, as interest, you know, as excited as we are for that article, we decided to have our own little conversation. What are our top five out of the Marvel movies and what do we think are the worst? Now, we're also going to include, like, going back to all Marvel movies, not just the 22 or 23 that Disney... The Infinity Saga. Right. So we're going to look at everything. Uh, because there are movies that need to be recognized, you know, from over 20 years ago. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. But before we do that, we have a couple of this week's Sign of the Apocalypse. Um the first one I'm going to start with is, um, and I'm not trying to be mean. I just thought this was really funny. Um, Self-described ultimate Bill Murray fan who had never seen the movie Stripes. And the reason I bring that up is it is the 40th anniversary of the movie Stripes. Uh, so I had to rectify the situation and show her the movie, among other things, and uh, prove to her that, yes, this is one of the staples of Bill Murray movies that you must watch. Um, while it's not Ghostbusters, it may not be Groundhog Day, it may not even be Caddyshack, it's still, it should still definitely be in your top ten, if not your top five. And we watched it last night. That movie holds up, still holds up, no matter what. And as a former Army guy, I love to point this out. This was for all my Army vets out there. Yes, do what did he dumb is perfect cadence. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. And if you had, and maybe you had a really cool drill sergeant that recognized that fact and would let you do it. Uh, I had one that really did. And then I had others that were not fucking doing that song. <laughs> probably just because they got, probably because they just got tired of soldiers asking for it. If you are a Bill Murray fan, and you've never seen the movie Stripes, I question your fandom, but you can easily fix that because it's free in a couple places on cable or on streaming services, and you need to go watch Stripes. So, yes, my little funny story of this week's Side of the Apocalypse. The second this week's Side of the Apocalypse involves Skyrim. Brendan, take it away. They're selling it again. <laughs> yes. This game came out a week after my wife and I got married. That was nearly 10 years ago. They are selling an anniversary edition now, a 10th anniversary edition with a whole bunch of stuff included that you can actually get for free from the modders anyway. And they're selling it to us because it hasn't been sold to every person on every platform since 2011. So apparently they've got like five more people they have to get. Um, they, you know, they wanted to complete the set. Anyway, you know that meme 
where you've got Arnold and, and Carl Weathers shaking hands from the beginning of the predator. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's like right now it's like rockstar games, Bethesda games. And the handshake is selling the same game to dumb people over and over again for 10 years. Guys do something new. I mean, supposedly you are. I mean, supposedly Starfield's coming out. Supposedly elder scroll six is in development. Although I'll probably see that a day after I'm dead. Um, you know, just try to do something new. I mean, come on, 10 years and you're still said, what is this? The 42nd different version of this game you've re-released for sale. Here, here's my issue with this. The people that are going to be buying this and playing it yet again, which I don't have a problem with you keep playing Skyrim. That's fine. Great. You don't have to keep buying it to play the same game when you can download new content for the game you already bought. But it is literally for the people that, oh my God, it's a, it's, a, it's a new edition. And I must have it because I love this game so much. It's not even the best Elder Scrolls game to begin with. Um, and, well, depending on who you ask, that's either Oblivion or it was uh, Morrowind. Right, exactly. Three or four, you know. So this is this is but, all of the systems it's been released on, not just the not just the editions, just the systems. Microsoft uh, went PC. PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series XS. So, again, I'm pretty sure you still have a disc. You can still get downloadable content using that disc or a digital copy. <clears throat> Everybody pretty much has a digital copy because it's been on sale so many times for you know less yeah. than 10 bucks. And here's my personal favorite. And I actually saw a comment from an Xbox user. I can't wait to get this game again. And I'm like, do you have Game Pass? Yes. You already you have can. it. <laughs> With the downloadable content. It makes me twitch, man. It seriously does. Like, this is the reason, like, the, the gullibility. The gu- um, gu- 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 gullibility. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hans or Simon Peter Gruber over here. Thank you. Uh, uh, The gullibility of the average gamer just to keep buying this shit is the reason why game designers and game publishers are so fucking lazy. This is the reason why Madden's Super Bowl celebration hasn't changed in eight years. Come on, guys! But, don't don't fall for this shit. Don't buy it. And by the way, and in comment to that, you want to you want to make Chad Womack buy Madden for the Super Bowl celebration? Fucking put Prince in there. <laughs> <laughs> Do something original. <laughs> I would freak. Now, if they if they actually could get that okay from Prince's uh, estate, I'd be shocked, and I would applaud their efforts. Mm-hmm. I right. would buy it. Right now. For all of you out there that are going to be buying this new Skyrim because it's a new edition and, you know, it's shiny new and you want to spend your money because you love it, that's great. But we would also, from that nerd show, like to introduce you to a a new program where we like to help out Nigerian kings that need help. And we're going to be asking for... (laughs) We're going to hell for this. ...more money and donations... Okay, and in doing so, we'll make sure that you get one of many versions of Skyrim <laughs> you already have. <laughs> what do you guys think? Sound like a good deal? Uh, and you know what? If we're still talking about the g- 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 gullibility, yes. I tell That's you so- what, for a limited time off, <clears throat> you do it this weekend, I will give you the magic beans for free. <laughs> Hell, I'll give him the friggin' cow. By the way, just just cause, <laughs> just because just because you brought it up uh, with you know Die Hard with a Vengeance, best line in that movie. John, there's 14 billion in gold bullion in the back of the truck you're driving. Would a deal be out of the question? Yeah, I got a deal from you for you. Why don't you come out from all that rock you're hiding under, and I'll drive this truck up your ass. <laughs> How you know, colorful. up your ass got used a lot in that freaking movie. Yeah, yeah. People were but I obsessed love- with think- putting things up people's asses in that movie. But but I just love the response from uh, Jeremy Irons. How colorful. 
I, I, right. I like the gold bar thing about it. He'll be he'll feel a lot better when he checks the back seat. Back seat. Oh, man, that was my gold bar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to get back to talking about some of the Marvel movies then and now. But before we do, I want Chad, while I grab another cup of coffee, to talk about what's going on the Electric Jellyfish podcast uh, uh, week and no. next week. Well, funny you should mention that because we just kind of covered the the Spider-Man trailer and the uh, Eternals trailer. We broke that down and uh, how excited we are because, sorry, I, I hadn't seen the uh, the. King's I, I listened to it. It was a very good podcast. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, we, we went off on a, our, our usual 35,000 tangents. But um, yeah, uh, for those of you that are uninitiated, we're really pumped about uh, uh, No Way Home, but fairly ambivalent about uh about eternals i think they're more or less just telling a story that nobody really wants to freaking hear well yeah uh, and i i think you guys said it best like nobody asked for this nobody wanted no, it no you know and you're shoehorning 12 characters into a movie that nobody knows yeah and let's face it let, let's call it what it is um his name is not icarus his name is rob stark superman <laughs> <clears throat> uh, slash homelander or, or you know is yeah I don't know. It's just that I've got such a bad, you know, I've got such an Indiana Jones, Han Solo bad feeling about this. Uh, yeah. I, I, and, you know, I, honestly, just, I know it feels like the first really major flop for MCU outside of Black Widow. Like, I just, you know, and actually, I have a bad feeling about uh, Far or No Way Home, too, because I just feel like that movie is going to turn into. Like the story is just going to have so many holes in it because, and this is my fear about when you get into multiverse and time travel, when you get into multiverse and tra time travel, it's, and especially if you're not doing like one specific alternate timeline or two specific alts, but we're talking about just overlapping multiverses. Shit gets wonky real quick when you're doing storytelling because you write yourself in a corners and then you write plot holes and I'm just not confident about what they're going to write. I mean, you know, just the whole thing with Peter, um, <clears throat> you know, and then I, I just think there was just so many, like, I don't know. I, I got a bad feeling. That's all I can say. I can't put my finger on it. it, it does, does it feel I, like that they're juggling chainsaws and all of a sudden they yes. get an itch on the tip of their nose? Yes. Yeah. Look, as much as I like Doctor Strange and stuff like that, and I can't wait to see, you know, his next movie, and, and Benedict Cumberbatch is perfect uh, for that character. I think that we're missing the point on being able to use him to change time and make, you know, people forget, as they were explaining in the trailer. There's already an old adage, you know, about making people forget, you know, who you are, and that's just a simple kiss as Superman <clears throat> demonstrated in Superman 2. Because that perfectly makes sense. Uh -huh. And the best part is you don't even have to explain why, that, why that's working, which they never did. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I, realized, I didn't realize Superman was a wizard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love Superman too. But, you know, if you, you look back at it 40 years later, you're like, so he has the power to kiss people and make them forget. Um, if that's true, in every other storyline, is it is he like doing 50 first dates with Lois Lane every time he kisses her? And then having a reminder of what's... Anyway. But, you know, whatever. No. Uh, it, it, we'll All see I know... it. <laughs> The funniest meme I saw about this, the No Way Home trailer, though, is uh, Dr. Octopus when, <laughs> when he sees Aunt yeah, May in this timeline. <laughs> and hey. Suzanne and Alfred Molina's got a big grin. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, I'm sure it'll be entertaining. But, you know, part of the reason we're having this discussion about Marvel movies is you kind of have three tiers of Marvel movies. You have these that just you know, they're really not that good. They, you know, they serve a purpose to kind of continue the story, but at the end of the day, it's like, eh, all right, whatever, we saw it, blah, 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 blah. But then you have the ones that are really, really good. And then you have the middle that are like, they're okay films. But again, they're continuing the story and they connect to, you know, a larger story. And then there's the and Fantastic Four movies, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> By the way, I will 
tell you that right is now, the bottom that, tier right there. The, yeah. The, yeah. I will tell you right now that the worst Marvel movie ever made was that last Fantastic Four movie. And oh, God. You know, there's also X-Men's origin Wolverine, though. Yeah. You know what, though? <laughs> yeah. I, I can at least appreciate that one because I thought um, Liv Schreiber, you know, was good as uh, Sabretooth. But that's like... That's, that's like one of the more redeeming things about uh, that movie compared to the utter just bullshit of that last Fantastic Four movie. Um, yeah, and all, I put... have to, all I have to say is this. Whatever your whatever coke you were on in making that movie, go get a new dealer. Because <laughs> <it's not laughs> yeah, they're cutting it with some weird shit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think into that 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 bottom fantastic four tier, we could throw uh, Ben Affleck's Daredevil and Elektra. <laughs> so movies so bad, you had forgotten they existed, didn't you, Chad? Because right. I left them off my list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and now Ben Affleck hates this show because we reminded people that he did a, a Daredevil movie, <laughs> and Jennifer Garner like, <clears throat> like they. We all do that one movie where they pay us lots of money. I did Electra, you know, Electra. Like, yes, you did. So yeah. is is Affleck and now and you're doing Capital One walking commercials. into Doctor Strange's office saying, "Could you do this spell for us too?" Yeah. <laughs> like, and now she does Capital One commercials. Yeah. What's in your wallet? Um, I expect hey. a check for that Capital One, or at least knock off a couple hundred bucks off my credit card bill. Anyway, by the way, um, here, here, here's a theory of mine. Um, she did the movie Peppermint because that was the Electro, Electro movie she was actually uh, promised and never got. <laughs> Not saying it's a great movie, but I think that's what she thought she was going to get to do. It's better than Electra. You know, and then there's some, there, then there's some like, weird Marvel movies that weren't good, but the portrayal of the main character was excellent, and that's Thomas Jane's Punisher. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like he I was mean, an amazing punter. Like he absolutely should have gotten a second movie as Punisher. Oh God, yeah. Because he, he, he had he, to deal with, you know, he had to deal with John Travolta doing his worst Nicolas Cage impersonation as the villain. I love John. I love doing John Travolta. doing scenery that's so so much he needed toothpicks. Yeah. Look, I love John Travolta. He is extremely nice. He was fun to interview, but. It's it's almost like what Brendan said. You're channeling your ridiculous. You know what he's, it is. He's not just doing the. He's not just doing his worst Nicolas Cage impersonation, but he's doing his worst Nicolas Cage impersonation of Nicolas Cage on a bad day. Well, no, it's almost like he looked at how Nicolas Cage was performing his uh, bad character in uh, the movie Face they off. did together. Face off. Yeah. Yes. And thought that'll be good, but I can amp it up a little bit. Like, no, that's not what you should let's, do. No. Let's fact, also let's also not glaze over back. the fact. Let's not glaze over the fact that this movie was severely hampered hampered by its location. Not many superhero films are set in Tampa, Florida. God's <laughs> waiting room. <laughs> oh, okay, very true. very true. But it, but if John Travolta is going to channel like you know his inner bad guy, then go remember one of the films that you did where you were a great bad guy and that was broken arrow broken arrow yeah but yeah. but say, if you say battlefield earth i'm gonna throw this laptop across the fucking room no <laughs> battlefield earth no. is only a great movie no. in scientology in the halls of scientology yeah there it's an amazing <laughs> cinematic masterpiece and it's won every oscar from then until now when he had the nerve <clears throat> to compare his character turl to vader I i'm like yeah he's he's out of his mind He's 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 lost his freaking senses. Oh no, that was that that line was spoon fed to him for him. Had to have been. Hey, you, you, again, go ahead. Whatever coat, whatever coke you're on, change dealer. <laughs> Get a new dealer. <laughs> it's not the change dealer. All right. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, we're not gonna go. We don't have time to go through all you know movies or whatever. And we've talked about this year in the past. So we're gonna pick like what our top five of uh, the Marvel movies are, and. <clears throat> you know, kind of talk about our, you know, absolute worst. Again, my pick for the absolute worst Marvel movie ever made was that last Fantastic Four movie that never should have been made. And 
however, there is one bright side to that movie. It, it makes an absolutely great drinking game. But you will probably get alcohol poisoning. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> Have some epic hack handy. <laughs> um, all right. Now, <clears throat> so we'll start, we'll start it this way. Uh, that's my absolute worst Marvel movie. Uh, Chad, what do you think? And that's everything. I mean, including the Blade movies, X-Men. Um, and we're doing this in the last 25 years. We're not going back to the 70s with the <laughs> first Captain America oh, movies. Well, yeah, we'll, leave, we'll, we'll, leave, us the we'll leave the Dolph Lundgren, uh, Lou Gossett Jr. Punisher off the list. Um, <laughs> well, we, we can't talk about... Uh, uh, J.D. Salinger's uh, friggin' uh, descendant with the with the uh, uh, rubber ears on the side of his mask, Captain America. Okay, well, shit. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess I would have to. Say, well, it's really hard to pare it down to one. But what happened with most of the X Men films? That you started out so strong with the first X Men and the first First Class, and then everything just kind of started to steeply go downhill i mean x3 the last stand the aforementioned you know, wolverine origins uh uh oh good lord uh uh apocalypse dark phoenix they they screwed up so much about the about the uh, <clears throat> x-men mythos that it's really hard to depend it down to just one x-men film where they really tanked it um uh, so pretty much almost every x-men except for the first two in their respective uh, respective franchises Everything after the second film just kind of. I don't know. Um, I would disagree about Days of Future Past. Oh I no think. no no no! I'm not counting that one. I'm not counting that one. I'm no no. I'm he was saying it. that's. He was saying that was one of the first two. Like so the yeah. the first X Men and then when they did the new cast, the Days of Future pa Past cast, that one was good. But everything after that in yeah. that run of actors was I mean, not so yeah. much. I, I did. I like first <laughs> class of the movie because I think it's a good origin of setting everything up. Yeah, same um, here. Same here. I love First Class. I love Days of Future Past. It's the ones after that that screwed up, just like yeah. X Men One and X Two. Like, X can we never do Dark Phoenix ever again? Because yeah, because they can't seem to get it right. Yeah, they, they can't, can't write it, right. it. So let's just not do it. Yeah. Um, which, the by the way, I, I think the funny thing is, I think the only point in this, it's funny. You know, we were just talking about this with the Eternals and and, and your your trailer podcast. I, I actually think I know the only reason the Eternals are being brought into the MCU. What's and that? that's to introduce the X gene into the MCU because the Eternals were created by the Celestials and the Celestials also created the X gene. This is true. Yeah. So yeah. if they introduce this, they're in and they, we know there's going to be a Celestial in the movie. We saw that in the trailer. So I think the only reason they're going to, and remember they can only interfere if they're fighting the deviants. So, which is just a stupid ass. Okay, if if that's why you didn't interfere interfere with Thanos, uh, I hate to break it to you, Thanos has a deviant gene. Yes, he does. We talk anyway. About that. Uh, so you know that's stupid. So the only logical explanation I have for them doing an Eternal movies now is to introduce the X gene into the MCU because now they have the rights back and they can do it. That's a damn good point. I, that, I, that didn't well, even occur they are, to me. They've already said that they're going to be reintroducing, you know, the X Men. So it's like, that's great. Now, my but you know, the way they do that, that probably won't happen till Phase Five, yeah. which means they are going to start slowly planting the seeds. And it wouldn't surprise me if they drop some type of post-credit scene that references mutants somehow. Mm -hmm. Right now. Uh, for me personally, my theory is uh, I think they just wanted to make a movie uh, for Game of Thrones fans to actually have Kit Harrington and Richard Maddox on screen together again after, you know, heart-wrenching deaths and people complaining about the ending of Game of, Game of Thrones. That's my theory. Sound so. theory. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Brendan, what do you think is the absolute worst Marvel movie? I said it earlier, take your pick on which Fantastic Four movie you hate. Really? Like, you think all of the Fantastic Four movies are I terrible. didn't even like the first two with uh, with Jessica Alba and you know um, yeah, Owen, and Grafeld, Owen Grafeld and <clears throat> uh, Chris Evans. Chris Evans, yeah.
I'd like to try to forget as much as I can that Chris Evans is actually two characters within the Marvel universe. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I have to forget one, well, it's obviously going to be the human torch because he's a good cap. Um, so yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if I had to pick the worst one, um, I don't know, probably the one with, um, Killmonger in it as another as the human torch. Oh, yeah, as Johnny because that's a, because apparently we we have to <laughs> excuse me <laughs> apologies. Apparently Johnny Storm has to like is a way to get into a better character in the Marvel <laughs> universe. <clears throat> that's your audition. Like you, get, you get it's like if you didn't get like the one character you really wanted, you have to play Johnny Storm first, and then if you <laughs> survive that experience, they give you a better role. <laughs> That's the that's the deal with the devil you made. Okay. Yeah, this will define my career after this piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it's like fair. all right, we really like you, but we don't have a place for you right now. So we're gonna have you play Johnny Storm, and then four years later, we're gonna have you play something that's actually cool. Four years later, you'll right. get your you'll get your make good role. Yeah. So yeah. So no, I mean, the first one I can kind of live with. I mean, I didn't think the cast was terrible, but it. it You've never really been able to do the Fantastic Four right. You just haven't. I mean, at this point, I feel like the Roger Corbin version we never got probably is the best version. God. <laughs> and and this is something we discussed on the podcast uh, either this this past episode or the one before about if they're going to do Fantastic Four in the MCU, they need to set it back about twenty years. Or maybe right. thirty or forty years. Set it in the sixties. Give us Herbie. You know, give it that. Give it that kind of like the uh, the Loki TV series look. Make make all the machinery really vintage looking and have antiquated technology, and then work their way into modern era. Right. I, don't, I don't. I don't know. I just don't think if you introduce the Fantastic Four in the two thousand twenties, it's just. I don't know. They're just one of those. Uh, it's one of those families where I just think it would look kind of weird in a modern setting because it always has. My my thing about the Fantastic Four is. Are they really that interesting? No, <laughs> no, they're really not. There's not, not much. I, the, the, and once again, it's a vehicle for something else. The only reason to bring the Fantastic Four into the MCU is to introduce Doom. Mm -hmm. Right, because he's the only thing interesting about the Fantastic Four. I like think maybe, maybe, you know, maybe they'll do it to introduce Doom and Silver Surfer and by extension Galactus and Galactus will be the big bad right. at phase five. So, because they are apparently doing another Fantastic Four movie because apparently we just can't get away from what is this, the fourth reboot of it, the third reboot of the original? Who cares? Right. <clears throat> so. But yeah, so uh, I think sorry. we can all agree Fantastic Four sucks. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know. It's just at this point, it's like, you know, what do you really do? And can you rescue it? I mean, they keep talking about, well, Emily Blunt and John Krasinski, you know, can do it. And like, I, I feel like they would do a good enough job. I just don't think the characters are interesting enough. But, you know, whatever. Um, okay. Let's move right along and talk about our top five uh, Marvel movies. Uh, and I'm going to start off with this one. Uh, in my top five, the first X-Men movie comes out at number five. I love the first X-Men movie. Uh, it's great. But, you know, it, it, you're, you're right. It all kind of went downhill after that. Uh, you know, first couple of, you know, prequels were all right. Um, but, yeah, I got to... In fact, I kind of also tie it with um, the last. It's it's a tie with the last uh, Wolverine movie, uh, which I always. I love Chloe Chloe James and her titles on her reviews. She, her and I did that press screening, loved it. Uh, even watching it in black and white, you know, a, a second or third time we saw it was great. But I think she summed it up. Um, that she said, she basically said that it was the Wolverine movie we always wanted and deserved. And it was kind of a fitting end to 
Hugh Jackman as Wolverine and Charles Xavier and stuff. And it, there was just, a you know, kind of a passing of the torch to other mutants. Um, but I figure as book ends on X-Men movies, they're just perfect together. Like you have this great setup and then you have this and everything in between. It's just, it's convoluted. Some is good, some isn't. But these two movies kind of tie for me at number five. That's me. Brendan, how about you? Uh, I'm going with Blade 2 because it's the best of the Blade movies. And if it wasn't mm. for Blade, there wouldn't be an MCU. Um, and true? Blade 1 was excellent, but it has not aged well. The CGI was really bad, uh, especially at the end when yeah. Steven Dorff turns into Lamagra, the blood god. Um, that CGI was properly terrible um but it's still a very good movie but blade 2 was by far the best movie of the three and sadly didn't allow donnie yen to talk um but uh but he you know when you have ron perlman uh sparring verbally with wesley snipes for the entire movie just let those two guys go that's cool (laughs) And that's you basically what? what the director did, and then it would it was beautiful. I, I'll tell you why Wesley Snipes in the Blade movies uh, are great. And if you want a perfect tribute to that, if you watch the show What We Do in the Shadows, uh, oh. the FX were based off the movie, fantastic. But in the first season, when they have to go before the vampire the council, <laughs> right, right, and it's all like people who played famous vampires in movies. Like Danny Trejo and uh, Jermaine Clement, you know, take away TD from the movie, but they bring Wesley Snipe in on Skype. He's part of the council, <laughs> and they're like, they bring him in because they couldn't get Kiefer <laughs> <laughs> or Brad and Tom. Right, right. <laughs> um, and Wesley Snipes, you know, just his commentary on you know being a vampire slayer but being half vampire and trying to do it on skype that's not working uh, <laughs> i just thought it was brilliant. like thank you thank you for you know recognizing the blade uh uh you know the blade movies in wesley Snod for I, his contribution. and it, he did give me one of my favorite lines ever um to express you know just disbelief at stupid people um and it really doesn't make any sense and that's why it makes sense and that's some motherfuckers always trying to ice skate ice uphill. Skate up a hill. <laughs> <laughs> I use that all the time. <laughs> I use that all the time. Nice. All right. Uh, Chad, how about you? What's your uh, number five? I had a tie that actually included your tie uh, as, as, uh, as number five. It's Logan and Black Panther. Okay. Uh, uh Logan, for the same reasons you, that you said, it was the it was the perfect swan song, the perfect curtain call for that character. It's it's one of the only Marvel films I can think of that I walked out of where I was like, I'm not crying, you're crying. When when I when you, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it, it it just really blew me out of the back of the theater. But Black Panther for ushering in that era of that bringing that character in, the fact that it was the first. Uh, MCU film nominated for Best Picture. Uh, uh, it, d- just how it elevated not just storytelling, but pride in storytelling. Uh, uh, it was just, to me, it was just a, a, a landmark film. So I I'll love both the, of those. I'll be the first to admit that, you know, I, oh, I love, you know, Black Panther. It's a good movie. It, it doesn't really crack my top 10 personally. Uh, it's still somewhere kind of in the middle, and I still feel it's a little overrated. Uh, part of it is is I don't buy Michael B. Jordan as an antagonist, uh, um, but you don't take away from how great Chadwick Boseman is and that origin story mm-hmm. and where Wakanda falls into the MC universe. Um, and they did. I mean, it's. It, I'm not saying it's a bad movie at all. I just feel like it is very overrated and where people place it as like one of the best. And I'm like, no, it, it isn't. But 
I'm glad that we have it, and I'm glad for the performances. And I don't really want to see Black Panther too. I'm like, I don't. If Chadwick Boseman is not going to be there, which made that movie, I don't want to see it. But I know we have to move on, and you know, I will say this though: if you don't get teary eyed at the end of Infinity War, and then get fucking teary eyed when they walk out of the portals and he just smiles at Captain America, mm-hmm. yeah, you no, know, yeah. you have no. I'm sorry. No. Go exchange it at Walmart because your soul is broken. <laughs> yeah, you're done. You're done. Um, all right. Number four in regards to Marvel movies for me um, uh, is the uh, uh, first Captain America movie. Despite the really ridiculous three or four minutes of them playing that god awful cheesy song and dance song over and over. That scene lasted way too long. I, I love the movie as an origin story, and it's great. And Tommy Lee Jones was the perfect colonel. Uh, I his his one liners were perfect. Uh, I, I especially love when they're racing to try to catch the plane, and you know he kisses Peggy and looks at Tommy Lee Jones. I ain't kissing you. <laughs> <laughs> I love Captain America, so I that's that's my number. Four. Um, now I can also tie it with Thor because I, I like Thor's origin movie for, you know, what it is. Um, and again, a great cast. Uh, so, uh, but Thor Dark World, like, I understand you have to explain something, but that's very much at the bottom of the MCU universe. Yeah. So that's, like I said, I can put those two movies as a tie. Brendan, how about you? Well, like you two, I actually can make up my mind, and so there will be no ties in my list. <laughs> so, Bye. number four for me is Thor Ragnarok God. because we it, it look we needed a fun movie, and it delivered. Like comic book movies are supposed to be fun. Sometimes the MCU gets a little too serious with itself. Um, right. So yeah, um, comic movies. Need to be fun. Thor Ragnarok was fun. Although it is making Taika Waititi a little big for his britches. Like all the success he's having, he's kind of the arrogance he's kind of exuding right now in every interview that he does is reminding me of early 2000s. Um, oh, what's his name? Pulp Fiction. Uh, Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. Thank you. I don't know why I couldn't think of that name. But, uh, uh, someone's still not awake um so uh yeah it's it just he's just coming off as super arrogant and super condescending and a bunch of in- interviews i've seen lately and it's like dude you're like one bust away from having your career being over at all times as a director so right. maybe a modicum of humility you yeah, be, care- be maybe- careful don't get yourself shamalan yeah exactly so <laughs> Because the next movie you can make is The Village, where yeah. everybody figures it out at the beginning. Uh-huh. Which, all right, I, funny story about The Village real know, quick since you brought it up. Story multiple times. Uh, all right, well, I don't know if I did it on the air, so I'll pass. I'll, yes. People people can tweet me if they want to hear it. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that's my number four. Yeah, all right, that's fair. I would, I would put Ragnarok, I mean, definitely in my top ten. I just... Sometimes I like the origin stories a little bit more. All right. Which, by the way, these are my, I I just want to clarify something about the list. These are not the ones that I think are the five best movies. These are my five favorite. There's two different things. So these are the ones I will watch. Okay. All right. Um, Chad, how about you? Fucking Brendan stole my thunder. (laughs) Stole my God of thunder. (laughs) So number Uh, four is Ragnarok. Number four is Ragnarok. Swear to God. Um, I like we watch that movie every couple of weeks over over here at uh, at Casa de Casa de Jellyfish. Um, I have not had that much fun watching like when you watch when you watch Thor's character arc go from this does mother know you wear her drapes to this constant punching himself in the nuts kind of uh, right. 
fun loving guy you know you really see this transformation from shakespearean to saturday night live almost uh right. it, it's, it's really a fun thing to watch the whole yes he's a friend from work you know it's it, it was just an awesome ride um and yeah although i may agree with you there on on uh what uh set set up for a big failure i was very happy to know that one of his greatest inspirations for Ragnarok was the 1980 Flash Gordon, and now he's been given the go-ahead to remake that film. So, yeah, let's see what happens from here. But yeah, I love right. Ragnarok to death. That's it's it's easily in my top five. All right, all right. I'm not I'm not saying it's not a fan favorite. In, in fact, as I'm working this afternoon, I may throw it up in the background uh, for the umpteenth time. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely good. All right, number three. Uh, simple Iron Man, the one that started the Disney Marvel, you know, universe and, you know, pretty much <laughs> made a new generation of people realize that, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, although I, I tend to think kiss, kiss, bang, bang, made people realize that, that. Yep. but, you know, for people that, that weren't used to him and especially a lot younger, uh, Iron Man started it all. It's just, it's phenomenal. He makes that movie. Uh, Jeff Bridges actually makes a really great bad guy. Um, you, you, you can't set the Marvel up, Marvel universe of what they're doing any more perfect than that movie. So that's my number three. Uh, Brendan, how about you? Uh, you know, I thought long and hard on this one, and so I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Good choice. Nice. nice. Good choice. Okay. Just because, look, it you know, it, animation does not get the credit it deserves, um, in, especially in sci-fi and comic movies, which I think is hilarious because most of our stories come from either anime, manga, or comics. So, right. You know, but they're like, but this, 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 there's this pervasive feeling that, oh, animation's for kids. Yes. And I'm like, I'm sorry, no. Like, I'm, you know, even watching, you know, Star Wars Rebels on Disney XP, XD, Chopper spaced a platoon of stormtroopers. <laughs> That's very <laughs> adult themed right there. Like, when you think about what actually happened, he just threw a bunch of humans out into the vacuum of space. And they show that on Disney XD. Well, so, it's, it's like, you know, the, you know, for example, look at the Shrek movies. The references yeah. they make in that movies are not for kids. They yeah. are for the adults. I mean, I, I get it. but I, And I know the reason they're doing it is so that in, adults can enjoy those movies as they're having to watch them over and over with their kids. <laughs> but, right. you, but, you you know, you're absolutely right, Brendan. And it's a great story, and the acting, and it gave us Spider Pig, um, and Nick, and Nicholas Cage, yeah, Nicholas Cage as Noir Spider Man was fantastic. Like you know, it's so like Nicholas Cage can either be the best actor on the planet, or the worst. It's amazing. He's like Schrodinger's Cage. You just never know what you're gonna get. Like until you open up the movie and find out. Oh, it's good, Nicholas Cage. Yeah. You know, <laughs> bees, bees, not the bees, Nicholas. Okay. Or it's, so it's that I, one. I want to. I want to point out that I feel like we're in that scene in High Fidelity where we're picking like the top five side ones and stuff, and I'm like the John Cusack. Oh, how very unoriginal of you. <laughs> what do you what's, what's next? Uh, you know, Beethoven's Fifth, <laughs> and, and you're going to have to be Jack Black with all these unique. So yeah. We're kind of like high fidelity, but no, that's a great one. And I, I feel like it gets kind of lost in the shuffle yeah. when you think of all the Marvel movies, but it should be thrown in there as again, a, a mixture of a balance for your audiences. Well, uh, not only that, but I think, I think also, and I think DC is actually, this is the one area I think DC does better than Marvel is with their animation, but mm -hmm. um you know, it really is an underutilized um, medium to get stories out there because, look, there's even in the comic book world, even with all of the advanced technology that we have today, you know, with <clears throat> Disney uh, and ILM developing the volume and stagecraft and all these crazy things that you can now do in film with CGI and everything, there's still some stories that you just can't do on right. screen, but you can do them in animation. 
Mm-hmm. And right. I, I just think that it, that was one of the best animated films I've ever seen and it deserved to be included. So it's my number three. Right. <clears throat> Chad, how about you? What's number three for you? Yeah, I get to be an original guy um, because I, I never had a more triumphant feeling comic book geek fanboy moment in my life than the two minutes of cinematic glory after after uh, that's my secret. I'm always angry and the punch that he throws and the money shot of the entire team and the you know, with the the Avengers is a, is a cinematic moment that we collectively, I can, I think I can speak for all of us collectively have been waiting for our entire <clears throat> lives since we first cracked open a comic book. Uh, yeah. That it's, it's the cinematic team up that I, that I think secretly we never thought we would get. Uh, and if we, if we did get it, it was going to be Roger Corman, fantastic four level schlock. And it wound <laughs> up being this absolute feast for the eyes overload for the senses uh and we i know i pretty much everybody in my theater stood up and cheered for it and they're like freaking yes you killed it thank you 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 creepy bastard joss whedon but thank you for for delivering on the promise uh because it really it really felt like delivering on the promise that had been made years before whenever they first established the mcu yeah um it, ironically, that was our uh, very first promo screening as that nerd show after Brendan had uh, joined because we started in April in 2012 uh, and I had an original crew and then about three weeks later, schedules changed and Brendan kind of came on board or maybe a month later. And that was the first time we went out, did trivia, gave away like shirts and whatnot and it was the whole thing. And yeah, I mean, sitting in the theater, and it was just you, me, and Aaron. I don't think anybody yeah. else showed up, but we were at <clears throat> uh, just the sheer amount of people that were cosplaying showing up. I mean, you know, it really felt like a Star Wars movie. But yeah, I remember the uproar in our theater, and we were in one of the larger ones when that moment happened. You know, there's laughter, there's everything, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a cinematic masterpiece of people cheering. I I will I, say. Th- Go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. The, the longest laughter I've ever seen or heard in an in a movie ever, puny god. Uh, <laughs> when he just turns him into you know Spike slamming Sylvester the cat over and over again, like you know, I'm sorry, that was the absolute um, inspiration for that scene was Spike slamming Sylvester the cat in, in Looney Tunes because it's ex- it was stripped straight out of Looney Tunes, and I wow. and. and I, it was fantastic. I laughed my ass off. My my favorite part of the evening is, uh, you know, we're <clears> taking pictures with kind of the crowd, and it was the high school kids that came as a you know group of friends that not really great cosplay, but unique cosplay of all of the characters. Like the guy who was dressed up as Iron Man was using like football shoulder pads painted red and yellow. <laughs> One dude literally takes the time to rip off his shorts, have a ripped shirt, and paint his body green to be the Hulk. And I think he said he even shaved his head. And, you know, one girl was like, I'm just here with my boyfriend. I'm not really a Congo person, but she dressed up as Black Widow. It looked great. But it was all, and I remember them cheering the loudest in that screening. Like, literally, it sounded like a pep rally every time you got to pick seat. <laughs> that was the moment for me realizing that it is the, the accumulation of all of our inner child, our fanboy nerdum, everything that we wanted in a movie that wasn't Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And that we knew they couldn't screw up like a prequel movie or, you know, controversial Disney sequel or whatever. And it just worked. And outside of the Infinity War movies, it really is the best accumulation of the Avengers coming together, you know, and and setting us step by step into the next phases. But that will lead me into what I think is number two on my list. And I do put the Infinity War movies together because if Avengers is that first Mm. accumulation of everything, that we wanted with the Avengers, 
the Infinity War movies, both of them take that to the next level, um, especially since they teased Thanos at the end of Avengers, and here we are, and we got kind of everything that we wanted, you know, despite tragic deaths and, you know, even some controversial stuff of Cap taking the easy way out and staying back in time and blah, 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 blah. But everything coming together in that final battle against Thanos, you know, that is cinematic masterpiece of, you know, when it comes to nerd. closest thing that I think you really get to experiencing what it was like to see like the original Star Wars movie in 1977. And, and here's the thing. You may think I'm wrong because they're two separate movies. No, they're not. Yeah. You don't watch them back to back, you know, when you put them on TV. You don't just say, well, we watched a video or we'll watch a week later. Like, no, no, no. You take the five hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you watch them because that's how it's meant to be. So I think that's number two for uh, me personally. Brendan, how about you? I got four words for you. Robert Redford, Marvel villain. Yes. <laughs> Captain America, the Winter Soldier. You and me, buddy. You and me, bro. <laughs> uh, that right movie was you. that movie was fantastic. It brought Hydra really into the forefront. I've always been a huge fan of the Hydra storyline. Um, and you know, first of all, anytime you get to see Gary Shandling say, Hail Hydra, okay, <laughs> RIP Gary Shandling. Um, you, you know, he was amazing. Uh, we were Marcus and I were actually the other night just talking about the Gary Shandling show and how amazing it was, and the fact that yeah. somebody didn't include it on a top 10 HBO originals list, and we were like, Your list is invalid, and you suck, and you should feel bad <laughs> for like your mine, opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when, you put, when you put a show like Insecure in the top 10 and you don't recognize the Gary Shandling show, you're an idiot. Yeah, you're yeah, yeah you're, you're, your list is bad. Your opinion is invalid and you should feel bad about it. Anyway, <laughs> moving back. Um, so, yeah, so I, I Winter Soldier is easily one of my favorite um, Marvel movies. And, you know, it's just because they, they nailed the tone of Bucky just right, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then having hydra fully infest infested shield that let's be honest that movie saved the agents of shield show agents of shield for the first 10 episodes was boring and it was destined to be canceled and then winter soldier happened and this is one thing i will fight feige on all day long i'm sorry feige you might be good at producing movies but the fact that you had a fight with the guy who ran marvel television and decided that you were going to move you know the tv away from the movies that was a stupid decision because literally winter soldier saved agents of shield the hydra storyline in shield it went from they went from getting like 1 million viewers a week to getting 6 million viewers a week yeah. And it was, you know, it was fantastic. And uh, I, I just think it's one, easily one of my favorite Marvel movies. Chad, is that your number two? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Winter Soldier is the Marvel film I recommend to people that don't give a shit about comic books. Because much like The Dark Knight, how it was just a great film in its own right, having nothing to do with falling into that genre of being a comic book movie, quote unquote, this right. thing just feels like a, a tightly written, tightly woven spy thriller, a la Manchurian candidate. It's just, I mean, literally um, yeah. everything about it works. Everything about it works. Nothing about it outside of the spangly costume screams comic book, just badass movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's no fat on it. It moves. Uh, it's it's just phenomenal to me. It, it, to me, it is just a a landmark achievement in not just comic book filmmaking, but filmmaking in general. Uh, and it, it was the uh, a, fa a fantastic gateway for the Russo brothers to take over and do what they what they wound up doing later. It's 
It's just, it's masterful to me. I just, I love and that even, film. Even, even his costume in that movie got a little more grounded and a little, a little exactly. less, you know, mm-hmm. a little less comic E. Um, it was more of a, you know, more of a tactical suit than it was, you know, something that you would expect a modern soldier to wear. Yeah. And, you know, it was, and like I said, Robert Redford, Marvel villain. Mm-hmm. Like you, you put him in it and it gets, it instantly has a, uh, an air of credibility and gravitas yeah. that you're not going to normally associate with a comic book movie. Yeah. Like Nicholson and well, Batman and, and Brando and Superman. It just, it, yep. it, it, it was the perfect fit. So everything you guys just said is one of the many, many reasons why it's number one for me. I kind of figured as much. I kind of yeah. figured that's where you were going with that. I, Look, the Infinity War movies you have to recognize as cinematic masterpieces for the reasons I said earlier. But I think that there is one movie that just stands alone as what you said. It is the Dark Knight of the Marvel Universe. There, it, there's so much perfection to it. The pacing, how it moves along. There's little things that I, little details that make it better. Um, Brendan's right. Robert Redford even said in interviews, he was curious about what they were doing and wanted to be, have that experience. And he chose this movie because of the story. Okay. And you don't get to see Robert Redford, Robert Redford be a villain and a sympathetic villain at that. Something where you're like, "Eh, you're a villain, you're a bad guy, but we kind of understand your reason. Okay. We still hate you, but you know, this is what happens. And uh, the other, the other thing that I really love is it takes into account the blending of generations, but tackling the issue subtly about PSTD, and mm-hmm. saying that even World War II soldiers had this. We didn't work on it as much, okay. And there aren't many movies that deal with it. And here's a way that we can do it from a hero to what we're dealing now. And Sam is the perfect soldier that says, I believe in you. And I don't care. I'm taking up the mantle to fight at your side. Okay. And you can say he's a sidekick. He really isn't. But it's that soldier's code, code that that idea and that theme that was instilled with why we love Captain America, why it is duty first and, you know, and also why he's perfect to take up the mantle of Captain America. Okay. I will also throw in this, this one's for me and Brenda too. If you're a fan of coupling, you have a little inside Jenny Agatha joke <laughs> because she's part of the little council. And again, that's just a little inside of, you know, why the, oh, the guys Jeffrey <laughs> and coupling love Jenny Agatha. And for those that don't know who she is, and you should know, she mm-hmm. is one of the early babes of sci-fi. She is the main female prota- uh, protagonist in Logan's Run, uh, American Will- Werewolf in London. That's the main thing most people know her from, I would think. Yeah, I mean, she's one of the early actresses to really get nude. And, you know, young men have had plenty of fantasies uh, about her. Still looks good 45, you know, years later. And uh, to have her kind of in this movie, too. And uh, But there's just so many little nuances and references, too. I, I like how they talk about, you know, they make the... Uh, the joke about war games would you like to play a game and then you know you meet the nazi doctor who basically is now a computer okay it just it, it everything works in it everything that you want in a comic book movie that is perfection comes together perfectly in this movie and it isn't just fan service unlike some movies giving you like i love ragnarok but i also think that's a lot of fan service and that's okay and it does drive the overall story or character arc of thor but i just think winter soldier does it so much better and gets us to where these characters are going and you know hydra and and and, you know the ups and downs and stuff like that so yeah it's it's the perfect movie If, if you're going to give a perfect 10 
to a Marvel movie, that's it right there. And that's why it's number one. For me. So, but I'm going to move right along as we're wrapping up. Brendan, what is your number one in the Marvel Universe? Well, this one, I had to decide one to leave off the list. So the, so the honorable mention will, will go to Deadpool. Um, but um, the first one, second one's good too, but the first one's just fantastic. Anyway, um, but my actual number one, uh, I'm going with Logan. Because that's the best movie, comic book movie that, you know, again, kind of like, you know, when you say, you recommend a movie to it that doesn't like comic book movies. Logan doesn't feel like a comic book movie. Right. Um, it's a extremely well done movie. And from the shooting, how it's shot to the writing, uh, to the acting between, you know, Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman. Um, yeah. Like, and you know, it doesn't have a memorable villain but it doesn't need one because it's not, th this one's not about the villain. I always say that you need a good villain. And I do believe that for the most part, but because this movie is about the relationship between Logan and professor X, it doesn't, um, you know, it's actually better that it doesn't because a really good, really well-developed villain would have taken away from their dynamic. Right. So uh, yeah, that's my number one. In that, if anything, the villain in that thing is time. Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, time and, and society, you know, uh, you know, it's almost like a faceless villain is almost better because it's really just all of society that's against them. It's like everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, so. I, you know, we all kind of have that movie at, at a different place, but I think you know, we have to recognize that out of all of the Marvel movies in the last 30 years, that has to be in your top five and you're and if you don't put it in your top five, I feel like you don't understand what storytelling is. And, and understanding that, yes, you can have your fan service movies, the ones that you really enjoy, but you have to understand where they're going and, and how it, understand what the character arcs should be. Like, like, I mean, think about three different movies. If you give the first X-Men movie where it sets up X-Men and introduces Logan, great. Then you take days to future past where essentially he has to confront his own past to help kind of save the day and to save these people. And then you have Logan. You take those three movies and you have like this perfect trilogy of the Logan character and the perfect character arc. I mean, technically, you probably put all three of those movies together as one. And just say these are the Logan movies, and this is all you really need to know about the character. Right. Um, that and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you know him being in Japan and great choreography, martial arts choreography isn't entertaining, but it's also like I don't care. It doesn't serve that character arc. Any, it does. It doesn't serve the character arc compared to. The three movies I just mentioned. So. And it's, it's the reason, and it's the reason I give uh, Mangle to pass on being handed the the mantle of doing the next Indiana Jones film. If he can do that for Logan, hopefully he can also do that for Indy. So we'll, we'll oh, see. That, we'll see. That, yeah, that, yeah. Especially since he hasn't had Indy on set for the last three months, and yeah. it's all being, you know, deep faked. There's a reason why ILM went out and hired that dude. Uh, who deep faked Luke Skywalker better than they did, and it wasn't just to put more Luke Skywalker into future Mando shows. It's because, you know, Harrison Ford broke his arm or ruptured his shoulder or whatever the hell he did, and uh, they needed to deep fake Harrison for most of the movie. Yeah, so I'm sure it'll be entertaining, but at the end of the day, it's also I I, I love Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. You're like the Rolling Stones. It's time to retire. Yeah, <laughs> if you think you can do it. So anyway, what's your number one movie, Chad? You uh, again, it's the capper. The it, just like you described how Infinity War and Endgame really can't be separated. If you think that's cheating, Brendan, I apologize. But it, to me, that it was. Well, no, that one makes sense because that's that's okay. a two part movie. That's not. Yeah. That's that's not two separate movies. That's 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 
that's one movie and two yeah, parts. It's 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 it, book it, well, one and book two. It's like it's like the Deathly Hollow movies. I yeah, mean, I get that you had to separate them, but that really is one movie, and you watch it all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was the culmination of everything, that, and that's why everything everything since then has kind of felt like uh, the cigarette after the orgasm. Uh, just <laughs> in, Infinity War and Endgame was was such a culmination of you know we we like what I described earlier with the first Avengers film it was everything that we've been waiting for but not only did you have your first team up in Avengers but in Infinity War and Endgame you've got a team up of teams because now you're bringing the Guardians into it and you know all these other outside players that hadn't had a chance to tangle with the with the Avengers yet. Uh, oh God, uh, it's, and I, and I'm sorry if, if you, if you feel yourself feeling kind of cruddy at the end of a long day or whatever, and you just need a little pick me up, just go watch the reaction video of the scene we were talking about earlier when you first yeah. hear on your left and the portal start opening up. If that doesn't bring you back to that moment in the theater. Yeah. And uh, I, then yeah, something in you was fundamentally broken. By the way, that's the Rudy moment. <laughs> for the Marvel Universe. Oh my no, God. hey, no, there, I swear to God, there's a video out there of just that moment with like the Rudy music. <laughs> Jesus God, I haven't seen that. <laughs> I know, I've got to find it somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you, you get, you I, get, I, I could see that. You get so wrapped up in watching that fight and, and, uh, all the all the little pieces that fall into place and oh god yeah. just, i that was wish fulfillment that was uh that was bringing me way back to when i was seven or eight years old and saying god could you imagine if they were to ever be able to pull something like that off right around the time that the that the superman films were starting to crank out i'm like god can you I, imagine if they could do something on this scale with that kind yeah. of a budget and that kind of an effects work and make it all work and well, it fucking work yeah Considering when they first started trying to put Marvel characters on TV in the 70s and Iron Man looked like some underwater suit, red, yellow, and <laughs> Thor looked like a barbarian about to storm the gauge. <laughs> and our like, most our, our most our most vivid memory of it is uh Bill Bixby sadly walking down the side of the road with his backpack on. You know, that's that's really the most uh, vivid Marvel memory we have. Because uh, let's face it, every time we watch an episode of The Incredible Hulk, we got Hulk for what, two and a half minutes? You know, yeah. when, uh, we were when, lucky. Marriott Hart- when Marriott Hartley was here about five years ago at the Dallas Film Festival for that Jonathan Bradley movie, Three Days in August, um, and I screwed up and didn't tell Chloe that she had been in a Star Trek episode when we asked her would she be in Star Trek or uh, Star Wars, and she had to correct me, like, well, I was in the more, one of the more famous Star Trek episodes in the original series. We, I chatted with her afterwards and you know, kind of apologized, like, I failed as a producer. But we absolutely know who you are in the nerd universe because we've all watched the Hulk series. And she was like, you know, it's funny. I get how much I get recognized for just being in the pilot episode. Like, <laughs> we're nerds. We know these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got, we've got since, great memories when it, for shit yeah, that doesn't matter. But it, yeah, but she's done all this other great stuff. And, you know, her first movie was like Montgomery Cliff and Lee Marvin or something. And um, it, but like I said, I, I, I get what you're saying. All right, I want one last question, and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna leave you this weekend. Uh, we'll be back in a while. All right, what do you think is the most unnecessary Marvel movie out of everything they have made? Uh, me personally, it's Thor: Dark World. <laughs> I feel like you could have just told the basic parts of that story in flashbacks or something um, without actually making a movie. But I guess you have to, to kind of set up how Jane knows Asgard or whatever. But it just feels like the most useless kind of Marvel movie, at least in the last 22 they've made, um, outside of the Fantastic Four movies. So, but I guess you could also say uh, X-Men 3. That's my take. Brendan, do you have a movie that you feel like is just totally unnecessary? Does this have to be just MC or anything made by Marvel in the last 25 years? Well, same thing by Marvel. Okay, this goes back before Feige. 
Okay, this is when Avi Arad was running Marvel, and they were selling off properties to anyone who would sell it to buy them. Man thing. <laughs> Jesus. 2005. It was so bad, it got turned away by most distributors and theaters, and it was an abject failure. And nobody ever... I I like that. Who, Honestly, what, what cinematic behemoth of a mind thought looking at the pages of man thing yeah we can make this a hit <laughs> i hope that guy got fired <laughs> again whatever coke you're on change dealers so so yeah that was ah. the most that was the, the the most unnecessary like talk about a movie nobody asked for eternals uh yep <laughs> <laughs> Like seriously, man thing. I, 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 you know, it came out in 2005. I almost forgot that it came out. I, I actually came, I stumbled across it um, as I was researching my top five. And by the way, yeah, with the title that says man thing, it just sounds like a gay porn parody of a Marvel movie. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah. Like, Let's see what what has Brett Leonard done since Man Thing? He was the director. Let's take a look. Well, while um, you're doing that, Chad, what do you think is the most unnecessary Marvel movie? Uh, as far as the one that I'm ambivalent about in the in the MCU, I would probably say Captain Marvel because I just don't really feel like we got anything out of that other than just establishing her dominance and how she showed up to kick Thanos' ass. Uh, but if we're going outside of the MCU, fucking Ghost Rider. <laughs> Nicholas especially Cage the Ghost second Rider. one. Especially the second one. Especially the second one. Now, if we if we want to go back several years, Howard the damn duck. But I digress. Right. Well, yeah. But that's yeah. outside of the 25-year window. But Jesus Christ. Well, that is completely unnecessary. But uh yeah, I could I could throw up Ghost Rider. I mean, the first one I didn't hate. Uh, the second one, I don't even know why we made it. Like, I, I still don't even understand the point of that story. Um, so let me let me give you a quick smattering of the uh-oh. directorial brilliance of Brett Leonard. First of all, he did the Lawnmower Man. Oh, uh, that's what got him the gig. Man. Pretty good. Yep. I like that. Then he did Billy Idol Heroin, which I think explains the rest of his life. <laughs> uh, he did Virtuosity with Denzel Washington, which wasn't a terrible movie, but then he does man thing and he does Highlander, the source. And I am a huge Highlander fan, but that movie is the most God awful worst TV movie I've ever watched. And I was so pissed that they even wrote it. Um, And he's actually managed to work, but I mean, nothing after that, like that's like, he's still working. Um, He's got a movie in pre-production called dark star, but like, there's literally nothing like, like it's all just like shorts and so yeah man thing killed his career and it should have um so yeah there you go i i'm i i will go out on a limb and say that a gay porn parody probably would have been better <laughs> <laughs> and it would have continued his career but that's just me uh all right we're gonna close this out uh our next issue of our magazine will be out um, next Sunday, and you'll get to read uh, Hayden and Sydney Co- uh, Costa's our, uh, sibling rivalry about how they rate the Marvel movies and where they put the movie Black Widow uh, in the mix. Uh, we are not cl- including uh, Shang Chi yet because it's the next phase, but we will have our review at the end of the week. And you know, from what we understand, it's going to be a great movie, and we'll definitely let you know. Once we see it, I'm sure we're going to be talking about it. Uh, our schedule is going to be a little chaotic um, with Brendan's brewing schedule and stuff, but we will be back uh, at least maybe in a couple of weeks, uh, but we will be off on Labor Day weekend um, and everything else. But spoilers, news, catch up with Chad at the Electric Jellyfish podcast. We got you. Uh, especially the continuation of what's going on with What If. Um, but other than that, Stay nerdy this week. It's time to say goodbye. Take care, everybody. Guys.